Hello, my name is Felix Shipkevich, and I'm joined here today with my colleague, Yvonne Bowser Caballero. And today we're running a webinar um, that will discuss and examine the regulatory issues with closed and open loop payments or closed and open loop payment systems. Uh, for those of you who have joined us, we appreciate you joining um, our webinar series. Um, our firm regularly does webinar series in different subject matters, and we will begin uh, covering uh, subjects of interest to the payments in the crypto community. Uh, so please visit us, um, visit our website, shipkovich.com and moneytransmittallaw.com for more information in the future. In any case, thank you for joining and uh, let's begin. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'll keep it pretty short and brief. I'm an attorney for almost two decades. I was raised in New York City, went to Hofstra University School of Law, where I currently teach. I've been teaching there for over four years, courses like corporate finance and also courses involving blockchain and crypto um, <clears throat> services. Um, I uh, represent uh, I've represented for nearly two decades financial institutions, technology companies, banks worldwide in helping them navigate complex regulatory and legal issues. Um, I run a boutique firm with offices in New York City, Miami, and London. And um, if you'd like to know more about me, visit our website and happy to chat with you afterwards. Let me turn it over to my colleague, Yvonne. Hello, everyone. My name is Yvonne Bowser Caballero. I'm an associate here at Shipkovich, and I graduated from American University in 2019 uh, with my Juris Doctorate and grew up right outside of Washington, D.C., where I attended law school. Um, I primarily focus on transactional services here at Shipkovich in the global financial service industry, debt relief and settlement industry, fintech and emerging digital currency sectors. If you would like to learn a little bit more about myself, um, you can also find my bio on Shipkovich.com and please feel free to message me afterward as well. Thanks, Yvonne. So let's talk about the agenda. Uh, we like to always make the agenda interesting and fun. I always feel that over the two, two, two or so decades I've been practicing law, when I uh, often pre listen to educational materials presented by law firms, I just don't find it as interesting. So my goal today is be to learn something and to find it interesting. And today we're going to cover a subject matter. What is the difference between closed and open loop systems. Uh, we're going to discuss why they're relevant today uh, and how they apply to the regulatory environment and the payment systems. We'll discuss the different types of examples that are available in between open and closed loop systems. And subsequently, Yvonne will discuss the federal and state regulations concerning this regulatory ecosystem. I want to be very, very clear before we just dive right into it. This is a very, very complex subject matter. It is one that is very difficult to cover in a 30-minute webinar. You have to look at the specificity of issues surrounding closed and open loop payment systems. And specifically, what you see on your screen is you have, I've really dumbed it down to four primary areas when they apply. First one is in payments. Every time, every time you're dealing with a payment payments system, you have to be mindful of whether or not it's a closed or open loop system. The same has to be assessed for prepaid, prepaid cards, prepaid e-vouchers, crypto, I can't tell you how often I see crypto systems being built without first analyzing of whether or not that system is an open or closed loop system. And finally, rewards and loyalty points. We will discuss the differences, the types of open and closed loop rewards that apply. As I said about a minute ago, the subject matter is very, very vast. And we could spend an entire day discussing 
the characteristics of the different types of open versus closed loop ecosystem. In fact, during my uh, crypto regulatory course at Hofstra Law, I probably spend about three hours discussing the different characteristics just as it applies to the cryptocurrency space. So let's first start off discussing when and how did the open and closed loop system really come more or less into the mainstream of the uh, payment law or regulatory payment conversations. A lot has started in the past two decades, particularly with a lot of focus by your non-traditional banks, your neobanks or your fintech platforms, emerging fintech platforms that wanted to focus on those who are unbanked and underbanked, unbanked and underbanked. And what you see on the screen is you actually have two definitions and very often um, the payment community uh, mischaracterizes unbanked and underbanked. They're two different categories. Unbanked, those who do not have their own bank accounts. Underbanked means people who may have bank accounts or accounts with credit unions, but yet at the same time, they rely on the important services provided by financial services, non-bank financial services companies, like money transmitters, for instance, right? Those have been extremely critical to many different communities in transferring money from one part, from one part of the world to another or within that specific jurisdiction. You know, what you have also is a seven-year-old study. I couldn't find the most recent one, but I think the statistics more or less would not change. Is you see that 41, that, that in 2014, there were 41% of prepaid card users who did not have a checking account and 26% of the consumers in this group who believed that they would not be approved for a checking account. That's a pretty, pretty substantial amount of, users who are both unbanked and underbanked, okay? Now, let's dive into the differences between open and closed loop. I'll, I always like to start with the easiest one. The easiest one is discussing the closed loop payment system. A closed loop payment system is exactly what it means, right? If you draw a circle on a piece of paper and write in that circle all that space, that's the ecosystem that is closed and you can't take an eraser or you can't white out a little piece of part of that circle because the moment that you do that, you actually open that payment system. So a closed loop payment system does not have any intermediaries. It does not require a bank, for instance. You don't require. It's essentially a direct relationship between a user and that specific merchant. And I'll give you an example of what that merchant is, right? Starbucks gift cards, right? For those of you who are avid Starbucks users, if you have a, you know, uh, if, you, if you, somebody gives you a gift card, you can only use that Starbucks gift card in Starbucks and you can't convert it to cash. Um, you can only use it in Starbucks. Another really great example um, Banana Republic, uh, Gap uh, are affiliated companies. If you are using or Old Navy, I should probably throw Old Navy into that. If you buy a gift card from e either one of these three merchants, which are affiliates and the common ownership, that creates that closed loop. And you can only use the gift cards within that, those specific merchants. You cannot, you cannot convert them to cash. I can't, you probably, for those of you listening, think about the time that somebody gave you a gift card that you really didn't like and you went to a store and you said, well, can I just get cash for it? And they said, no, you can't. And if you bought something, you can't return and get cash. You would only get store credit. So that's really the, the, the main characteristic of a closed loop, you could only use it at that specific merchant, right? 
or affiliated merchants. You are not able to draw down or withdraw funds or convert funds into cash. You can only get credit, okay? Um, why are closed loop cards important, right? You're probably asking yourself, well, why would I care to do a closed loop card or use a closed loop payment system? And the short answer is, it's a great way for you to do branding. It's a fantastic way, right? Many times when merchants contact us and they say, well, we'd like to create our own card, uh, but we, we, we wanna be able to create a card that could also, we could sell and be used at other places. Well, it doesn't really help that much with your branding because if the idea that you wanna create a fast and inexpensive and also a utility, a card that has specific utility um, uh, within your merchant ecosystem, then do one that you can only use. And then you don't need to worry about banks. You just basically issue that yourself. I mean, you obviously need to have your own banking relationships, but you know, it's not one that you would not be able to use if you didn't have the type of banking relationship that you would need for an open loop um, system, okay? So a closed loop gift card or gift card payment system or prepaid system, it's a great way for brands to connect with new customers. It's very cost-effective, very, very cost-effective. You know, the, the, I, I immediately, when I start seeing that some a merchant wants to create its own branding, I always suggest with them, well, you know, the easiest and most efficient way for you to do that is um, create your own ecosystem. You do not have to think about money transmission rules. You do have to think about FinCEN rules and Yvonne will touch, touch on them a little bit later in this presentation. But here's an example. Starbucks executives credit the coffee cup change loyalty program and close up system with increasing revenue by 2.65 billion, billion. That's enormous, okay? So never underestimate the power or the ability for you to use and implement the closed loop system, which from a legal and a regulatory point of view is a lot more effective and easier to create. Let's talk about the open loop system, right? An open loop system is more complicated than the closed loop system, why? Because you open up the loop, you open it up, and now you're able to convert, to convert the stored value or the uh, converted um, medium of exchange uh, outside of that ecosystem, right? So, so let's talk about what are the common type of open loop systems, right? So. If you walk into Walgreens or CVS or Target or Walmart, sometimes by the cashier, you would see these cards, right? They'll say like American Express, $100 card, $50 card, right? Or a MasterCard, a Visa. And a lot of times you can, you know, grab it and give it as a gift to someone instead of using cash. You can use that card. You could use that prepaid card anywhere that card is the Visa or MasterCard, that payment network is accepted, right? So you're not tied to one ecosystem. You can go to any other merchants, right? To, to you know, many that just accept these cards, just like credit cards and debit cards, right? And that's a huge difference. You can't take a card that was issued specifically for closed loop system and use it outside of that ecosystem. But you can use an open loop payment card, the network uh, between the different merchants. You do have to be mindful that that raises a number of legal and regulatory issues. And most importantly, almost every single state has laws and regulations concerning stored value or money transmission, um, where you would have to analyze to what extent your open loop payment system, your open loop prepaid card would potentially be subject to that respective state where the customers are located, where that would be used money transmission laws or stored value laws, okay? 
And always, always you have to be mindful of FinCEN and anti-money laundering laws and regulation. And as I said, from the very beginning, we're just scratching the surface of the subject matter, right? So in order for you to have an open loop payment system, you need to be able to partner up and you need to be able to partner up with a network uh, like Visa, MasterCard, or American Express, okay? Um, and one of the key tests, right? I can't tell you how many times over the years I get calls from someone that says, oh, I created an open loop payment system, right? And, and, and uh, you could only buy this prepaid solution at our, on our platform, right? And my first question to them is, that's great, but can you redeem that and convert that to cash, right? You have to think about cash out, money leaving, right? If it's leaving, right, that merchant and is <clears throat> made, the return can be made in cash or other form of payment, right? It doesn't need to be store credit, which is what you typically see with closed loop, then that is very likely to be an open loop system, right? It's not so much money going in, it's actually money leaving the ecosystem. That's where you have to be mindful, okay? Open loop prepaid cards are most like credit or debit cards, right? And I said they're typically issued on payment networks like American Express, Visa, and MasterCards. Um, open loop cards have become more popular over the years have become a lot more popular than they used to be. Why? Because they give someone more flexibility to you know, use at many different merchants, right? If the closed loop card creates a level of branding and works very well, particularly with big franchises, merchants that are spread out within a specific geographic area, or if they're spread out nationally or within the state, Right where they know that, um, you know, they they their their patrons would be able to, um, uh, you know, continue to use the 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 stored value for open loop. You 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 open this up obviously potentially throughout the world as long as that specific payment network is accepted. So it's become a lot more popular, but often I see uh, how the regulatory and legal uh, issues are sadly ignored uh, in the creation of those. Let's give examples, right? Let's give examples. And I picked a few examples because we could, we could spend hours giving examples. I picked the most commonly known and easy to recognize. Let's talk about Libra, the Libra network, right? The Libra association uh, that was, you know, created or pushed by Facebook, even though they're denying that they was pushed by Facebook. But yes, it's, you know, obviously Libra is often associated with Facebook and big news a few years ago. What's interesting is that, uh, you know, the, the Libra network subsequently is, became a closed loop centralized system, a closed loop of virtual currencies that were specifically created to operate in a closed loop environment. And that we're only limited to transactional to those goods within that environment, right? And I think that was one of the biggest misconceptions because many people believe that Libra was an open loop system, and and you know validly so, you know, uh, for, if you're not very much in the trenches of of the uh, payments legal and regulatory environment, you would think that it's open, but in fact, it's closed. Closed loop, uh, virtual gaming, right? If you have an iPad or a phone or um, device and you've played those, you know, Candy Crush or World of War, uh, you know, games as an example. <laughs> In fact, even if you uh, play those like, you know, slot machine games that you download, you those are closed loop payment systems, closed loop, because you can only redeem those points on those specific platforms. You can't take those, you can't get those Candy Crush gold bars and then take him and buy an airline ticket. You can't do that, right? You can't do that. You can only use him to continue playing the game and, and, and expand uh, um, <clears throat> and expand that, you know, right there in the system. So anyway, you can't use it anywhere outside of that specific app, right? Or that software. 
Bitcoin, Bitcoin is an open decentralized system, but Bitcoin can be exchanged for real money, right? So Bitcoin is an open loop payment system because you can convert Bitcoin uh, into um, <clears throat> into dollars, into fiat, okay? Here's an interesting one. And I've worked on a few projects in the past few years, airline industry, loyalty points, that's pretty big. Uh, during the start of the pandemic, the airline industry experience, began to experience, and for subsequently close to a year, one of the major financial losses in its history since, since really the modern a commercial aviation existed. One of the things that became really a, a catalyst for survival, right, is, is the purchase and sale of airline points. Uh, and, and that's huge business for airlines. I don't know if most people realize, but airline points uh, are traded on the secondary market and create an enormous volume and revenue for these airlines industries. And, and, and during the pandemic, the, the, you, you know, so I, I flew uh, during uh, the summer of 2020. And uh, I remember flying on, um, on a flight uh, to uh, South Florida and JetBlue, which typically pre-pandemic would offer something like 40,000 or 50,000, you know, rewards would go as high as 100,000. I mean, that, that's incredible, 100,000, just because these points meant potential revenue because you would have to spend a certain minimum amount of money. But loyalty points, right, on Delta is an example, or JetBlue or United, you could pick an airline, they're closed loop networks, right, closed loop. You know, I can't take my Delta or JetBlue points and, and convert them for cash. I can't, I can use them, okay, in getting free flights or reduced flights or upgrades on those airlines, but those loyalty points are closed, okay? They're very, very similar to the Starbucks reward points that you typically get, right? For all of those of you avid um, coffee <laughs> drinkers, okay? Um, Credit card companies, right? And credit card companies offer you points. And that's also an interesting one because if a credit card is issued by a bank, for instance, you know, Capital One has this, you know, promotion that you see on TV, 2% cash back, right? But, but, but banks, right? Banks are allowed to do conversion. And so that's an open loop system, right? Because you can take your points, you could convert them into dollars and spend them however you want to, right? But if a credit card is not issued by a bank, they may be, and you can only apply those points only with the banks or with the merchants or with the goods and services on that bank's platform. There are only a few of them. Uh, then that would be a closed loop system, but it's very, very fact specific. The final part of my presentation before I switch over to Yvonne is, um, so open and closed loop payment system really is kind of a term of art, kind of a term of art, right? It's not necessarily, you, you know, you, except for the state of California, for instance, and a couple of other states that in their interpretive guidances, uh, you know, you don't really see a lot of discussion about what are the different legal and regulatory characteristics between open versus closed loop payment system? And as such, you don't really see a lot of litigation, right? Uh, and not as much enforcement uh, on the subject matter because the enforcement would typically be not, you know, they failed, someone failed to register as a money transmitter for being an open loop payment system. It's just they failed to register as a, you know, money transmitter, and that's it. But it is analysis that one should perform uh, when either building out or reassessing uh, their regulatory payment system. So now I'm going to turn it over to Yvonne, and she will discuss federal and state regulations. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to first discuss federal regulations that may apply to both the open and closed loop payment systems. So first, we're going to focus on Regulation E. Uh, regulation E was a regulation put forth by the Federal Reserve Board um, that outlines rules and procedures for, for electronic fund transfers. Regulation E um, has provided a basic framework to establish rights, liabilities, and responsibilities of participants in these electronic fund transfer systems. 
Um, most importantly, it implemented the Electronic Fund Transfer Act. Um, and as part of that act, the Consumer um, Financial Protection Board or CFPB instituted and adopted the prepaid card rule as of 2018, which focuses on open loop prepaid cards and the consumer protections that must follow regarding these open loop cards. Um, this covers traditional open loop prepaid cards, mobile wallets, person to person payment products and other electronic accounts that can store funds. Um, they give uh, prepaid accounts the same basic fraud protections that cover debit cards, such as clear disclosures, specific requirements for fees and expiration dates um, for various prepaid cards or gift cards. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Felix. All right. So, can I skip? Sorry, I apologize. Looking, I skipped. No, no you're yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, when looking at um, the prepaid card rule, uh, we need to outline what falls under the definition of a prepaid account and what falls under the exceptions. Um, so, as you will see on the slide, um, for purposes of the prepaid card rule, prepaid accounts do not include gift certificates, stored gift cards. Um, a loyalty award or promotional gift cards or a general ruse use prepaid card that is marketed and labeled as a gift card or gift certificate. Um, so since closed loop cards fall within this list, these lists of exceptions, they do not have to follow the strict regulations outlined in the CFPB's regulation E and prepaid card rule. Next, um, we're going to look at um, FinCEN's regulations of both the open and closed loop systems. Um, so FinCEN has adopted a targeted approach to regulating sellers of prepaid access products, and they focus on the sale of prepaid asset, asset product, access products whose inherent features or high dollar amounts pose heightened money laundering risks. Um, so on July 26, 2011, uh, FinCEN issued a final rule amending the Bank Secrecy Act to establish comprehensive regulatory requirements for prepaid access. So both providers and sellers of prepaid access must now collect personal information from customers, maintain transaction records, file suspicious activity reports, and comply with other requirements of money service businesses um, to determine if you fall under um, as a provider or seller, uh, providers of prepaid access um, can be designated um, as someone who has oversight or control of the program, um, including organizing, offering, or administrating, administering the program, whereas sellers are retailers of these prepaid access devices. So providers have, um, providers have to follow more requirements and must register with FinCEN um, forms of prepaid access that FinCEN has determined pose a lower risk of money laundering and terrorist financing are exempt from these regulations, but with some limitations. Um, before 2011, the FinCEN rule did not include closed loop cards, but as we'll discuss in the following slide, and with the increased usage and popularity of closed loop cards, there are some regulations that now also apply to closed loop prepaid cards. So a closed loop prepaid access, including in-store credit for merchandise returns, is regulated if more than $2,000 can be associated with the prepaid access device or vehicle on any given day. Um, low value open loop prepaid access cards, $1,000 or less, um, are also regulated now for the first time um, if it can be used internationally, transferred between or among persons, or reloaded by a non-depository, non-bank source. Uh, retailers who are exempt, um, who sell non-exempt forms of prepaid action, access are regulated if the prepaid access can be used before the customer's identity has been verified. Um, and persons who sell $10,000 or more of prepaid access per person per day 
including bulk sales of prepaid closed loop cards are either regulated or required to have policies and procedures in place to prevent such sales. Um, providers and sellers of prepaid access are required to collect and store personally identifying information as I discussed um, in the slide uh, before from customers on an increased range of prepaid products in order um, to protect against money laundering risks, um, as I stated before. So really other than FinCEN and uh, the CFPB's prepaid card rule, um, there are no other federal regulations um, that apply to both the open and closed loop systems um, other than those of state regulations. Um, so for state regulations, um, you open loop products often fall within a state's money transmission action, um, statute. Um, and if you think about why, it's because you can make third party transactions using these open loop payment systems. Um, some states have more specific requirements for open and closed loop products with more restrictions falling on open loop products. Uh, but you do have to look at it on a state by state basis and look at how each state defines money transmission and stored value. Um, closed loop products are usually not performing the act of money transmission, whereas open loop products are offering stored value. Um, so if we actually look at an example, um, Texas defines stored value as um, monetary value evidenced by an electronic record that is pre-funded and for which value is reduced on each use. The term includes prepaid access and does not include um, an electronic record that is loaded with points, miles, or non-monetary value, um, not sold to the public, but distributed as a reward, um, or redeemable only for goods or services from a specified merchant or set of affiliated merchants. Um, like Felix discussed with like Banana Republic, Gap, Old Navy, affiliated merchants. Um, so as you can see under Texas's definition of stored value, closed loop products would not fall under um, the uh, uh, fall under the act of the state's money transmission act. But again, you have to look at this on a state by state basis. Each state has different definitions, and there could be states where closed loop products do fall within certain regulations and restrictions. Um, and other than those few state regulations, there are no other um, generalized regulations for the open and closed loop payment systems. Thank you, Yvonne. That uh, concludes our uh, presentation. Uh, here's a little slide uh, that talks about our firm's payment and money transmission services. Uh, we work with money service business, financial services companies, uh, we do both transactional uh, litigation and regulatory work uh, for financial services companies, technology companies throughout the world. Um, we hope that you can subscribe uh, to our firm's affiliate uh, uh, aggregate, aggregator news website uh, that has a lot of free information from money transmission statutes to crypto statutes, as well as news about the payment and crypto space, uh, it's free. So really, man, there's no excuse. And here's our contact information. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions, we'd be happy to chat with you. We thank you for participating in this webinar. Thank you, Yvonne. And we hope to see you at our future webinars.